welcome to our uh, C++ documentary um, event and Women in ICT uh, panel discussion this evening. My name is Mahta and uh, thank you very much for your attendance. We've got very uh, distinguished people uh, tonight in our uh, panel from both the University of Melbourne and industry uh, that uh, I will introduce to you. Um, we have um, um, Associate Professor Chris Lecky, uh, who's a, a professor in the University of Melbourne. Um, he got promoted, by the way. I made a mistake. And, sorry. <laughs> and he's the head of NICHTA, and so thank you for um, uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, NICHTA uh, has been sponsoring this event tonight, I should mention. Uh, Thank you for that. And um, Associate Professor um, Shenika Kronoskera, if I pronounced that right, also from the University of Melbourne. Um, Dr. Vera Hansberg, PCF Manager at VLSCI. And um, Dr. Elaine Saunders, Co founder and Managing Director of Blame, Blame and Sound Hearing Aid Experts. Um, we have uh, Dr. Um, Karen Berspur, who will be moderating the panel this evening. And Dr. Priscilla Rogers from IBM Research. Um, and uh, also Dr. Irina uh, Dimitriscu. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, also from IBM Research. So welcome to all our panelists and welcome to everybody um, uh, we have um, this event is a joint event from Gelgi Coffees, um, one of our regular events, and also uh, we've had uh, uh, participants from uh, Women in Ice City, University of Melbourne, who uh, helped organize this, and Nikita, who um, uh, have uh, sponsored the event and uh, organized this. So what we'll be doing tonight is. Uh, watched a documentary about uh, women in ICT uh, called She++, which is an initiative by Stanford University students, and it addresses the lack of um, females in computer science and technology, which is an issue that's uh, caught attention, um, that we need more females in computer science and we need a gender balance. Um, and then we will have our uh, panelists here and then uh, we will talk about the uh, documentary and also you will get to ask questions uh, from the, our panelists. So um, that's it. Uh, enjoy the event. And uh, then we see you upstairs for pizza and um, refreshments. Physics. Good. Other technology uh, or science areas. Mathematics. 
Mathematics. Great. Engineering. Engineering. Good. Bioinformatics. <laughs> Bioinformatics. Fantastic. Good. That's what some of us in this room also do. <coughs> Good. Well, welcome everybody, and welcome. Thank you very much to the panelists for for being here. Um, I would like to start with um, some questions about the video itself. Um, the, the documentary is obviously very US centric and um, I thought we should maybe start the conversation um, with discussing whether some of the issues that were raised in the video apply equally here or whether there might be some differences between um, what's happening in the US and um, what's, what's happening here. Oh, and I forgot to have you introduce yourselves. So um, actually, let's start with that, why don't Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Russell Rogers. Uh, I actually do mechanical engineering at Monash University. I um, do a PhD there in micro and technology. So I think some of the issues that we have here you know, in engineering are um, typically very low um, you know, percentages of female to civil engineering in computer science. So I'm really like to talk about that perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my name is Irina from Trade School. I'm actually a mathematician. Although the numbers there were saying that there are so much more women in in maths, I, I think that's true and it's not. So I'd love to touch on that point because um, you, you see a difference in undergraduate and then graduate level, and then again, you know, it's it, it's a marked difference in who makes it into the academic world, for example, and what you have to do. You have to prove yourself in a different way um, as a woman. So that's probably something that. I'm currently with IBM Research. I've been um, working in many countries. I'm originally from Romania, but I've worked in um, Canada, in Germany. I came back to Australia in Sydney, so I moved back, back to, to London only a couple of years ago. So I can maybe offer a little bit of an international perspective to that. My name is Elaine Saunders. I run a company <coughs> which I founded Lady Saunders Ears, which is a telehealth company that supplies hearing aids that people can set up and fit themselves. We supply them over the internet. It's quite a disruptive technology. We have a team of 20 people in a number of areas, mostly ICT and customer support and audiology. And I'm proud to say that my ICT manager is not only a woman, she has a small child and she didn't get hired because she was a woman in all charge, got hired because she was really good. Hi, I'm Vera Casper. I'm the PCF manager at the OSCI. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the OSCI, it's the Victorian Life Sciences Computing Initiative, and Martab works there under LSEC. Um, anyway, I've only been here at the OSCI for about six months, and before that, I was overseas for about 17 years, so I'm recently back in Australia. Um, for a while, well, I've been in Finland for the last 12 years, and before that I was in Denmark in the US. And in Finland, I've been working in the IT sector. And before that, I was actually a physicist, a physicist in my former life, and I did my PhD here at Melbourne University, so I know Melbourne University well from those times. Um, and I can say that, it doesn't look like much has changed. <laughs> um, back in Roughly 20 years ago, I was very heavily involved with the Women in Physics program. Um, myself and a few other people, Anne Roberts and Rachel Webster, who you might know, um, they established, we established the Women in Physics group here in Victoria. And um, we did a lot of exciting things in trying to encourage young women to get into physics and those sorts of things. And it was challenging then, I think it's still challenging even in to other sectors. And IT, I mean, when I was in my first year of um, university, I tried to do, um, this is sort of anecdotal now, um, I tried to do a computer course in the summer time, you know, like sort of a summer course type thing, and I rejected it. I was like, I was so sad because I thought this would be a really great opportunity to sort of like pursue some things my brother had been showing me with the old x86 systems that, you know, like the little micro B lawns and those sorts of things. So I was very interested in technology. The first inklings of computing, but physics is what brought me to computers, and that's why I'm there. I am Shanta from 
My name is Chris Lecky. I'm uh, in computing and information systems here at the University of Melbourne. I'm also deputy director of the NICTA Victoria Research Laboratory. For those of you who don't know NICTA, it's a national centre of excellence in information communication technologies in Australia. Um, my background, I studied at Monash. I did combine science and engineering, computer science and electrical engineering. Um, did a PhD in computer science at Monash, um, with a female PhD supervisor. Um, <coughs> then worked in Telstra in their research laboratories for about 12 years in their artificial intelligence group, and then came to first electrical engineering here at the University of Melbourne, and then over to what's now computing and information systems. And I think one of the things that struck me was when I studied final year computer science back in 1934. Um, there was, you know, a small proportion of women doing final year computer science. I can't remember the exact numbers. I'd probably say about 20%. Last year, I taught the final year project subject for computer science. And out of 30 students, we had one female. <laughs> And it's a tragedy. So maybe we can start to think about why that's happening. Um, in the documentary, they they mentioned that there's um, there are some negative stereotypes out there about what being a woman in technology means, what being a technology person means. Um, Priscilla, maybe you can kick us off. Do you have any thoughts on how well, let's start with how accurate that image is <laughs> in your in your experience. Yeah, well, I think um, if I think about engineering and in particular mechanical engineering, which I did, the stereotype is that um, you love fast cars, you like to pull apart engines on the weekend, um, and you're just a rev head. Um, so I think you know, uh, for you know, males that kind of choose um, mechanical engineering, for example, you know, they've grown up with been with their dad in the shed, had a lot of exposure. Um, so obviously you get this stereotype that this is what mechanical engineering is. But in fact it is so much more. And I know for me, uh, going through school, I had no idea what engineering really was. I had I didn't know the stereotypes. It was just by plot luck really that I chose that um, that career because I liked maths and I liked science. So it's surprising that I didn't do computer science actually. Um, but I think that yes, there are stereotypes, and it's important for us, you know, to be able to really break those down, um, especially you know at the school age when people are, when they're starting to choose their you know basic subjects. So it's, I think there's a greater responsibility on all of us to to change what we think um, you know for, for the career technologies. Irina, you mentioned that. You um, have lived in lots of different places. Um, do you think that the sort of stereotypes that we've heard about are, are global, or are they somehow particular to um, English-speaking world? I think they probably are. They might differ. They might be different ones. I mean, you know, just as a side note, when I started um, universities and I did a mathematics degree, my dad came to me and said. Oh, I thought that all girls wearing mats were ugly. <laughs> What's with this? <laughs> um, but that was a stereotype. 
I heard a male person had about women in maths. You know, only boring, ugly girls would go to maths. And I thought that was tragic. And of course, he changed it from your own father. Though. <laughs> <laughs> it's really heartbreaking. But he was telling me that it was like, oh, I've changed my mind in that. But you really don't have to be faced with that to change your mind. And I, I had no idea that that was people's perception. Um, and when I was an undergraduate student, there were, of course, more women and doing maths than, than men. Then when you go at a graduate level, that's probably the balance changes. Then when you look at um, the requirements past PhD, you'll see those change again. You'll see that men get through the process of getting a job in universities, for example, a lot easier. As a woman, you'd have to do a postdoc. As a man, you don't necessarily have to do that. And that, I assume that, again, you, you just have to prove yourself more. And I think that's wrong. And I'm not quite sure how that would need to change, but that's something that I, uh, I notice myself. In terms of stereotypes, I mean, it's hard for me to tell because I did a computer science um, high school. So everybody in my high school, and so this were, those were six classes, everybody was a computer scientist, basically. So I can't really tell because that's all I know. Um, but I thought that computer science may be a bit scary for people who don't know what it is. It may be also because some people get into it a lot earlier, so it's frightening to those who don't know what it is and they think, oh, you have to have known this forever in order to actually start doing it, which I think that was a point that was made in the film. You can actually start it any time. You can learn these things. You don't have to be ahead in order to start a degree. Elaine, as somebody who <coughs> has started a technology business and is hiring people, do you think that um, the, the stereotypes or the barriers to entry for women are particularly problematic? I think actually women have some advantages, like you call it. I think I'd encourage anyone to think about themselves from the beginning, a bit as a business. Um, and in, it goes back to these stereotypes. You don't actually have to be that stereotype, but I think you do have to think about your own brand and your own image and what you want to look like. And I've been very aware that I have to move in technology circles and in business circles. I kind of have to look the path or be the path that I do for both. Um, I think that when people are looking for roles and for jobs, that women actually have a car they can pull is that usually, you know, I'm going to stereotypes too, we usually do better at networking. And a num I would say quite a number of my staff have got their roles because they had taken the initiative to do that. They reached out, they met people, they talked to people, they connected, they thought about how they wanted to appear and look and be and what they're going to do an interview and they got that break. So they're building on their innate strengths. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Looking for the job instead yeah. of waiting for the job to yeah. find them. Vera. Okay. Hold on. Can I ask a different question? Sure. Um, so one of the issues that they raised in the documentary was um, um, about the cost to the economy um, of, of women not going into technology. And of course, again, it was quite US focused, um, saying that, that um, U.S. universities will only produce about 30% of all of the technology graduates that are required. Um, is, that, is that something that you believe um, is important to address as well? Well, definitely for the Western world. Um, probably not for maybe the Indian world or the Iranian world because they're producing the people who would probably take those jobs in, as far as the, the female gender goes. Um, maybe People don't really realise what a fledgling technology computer science field is. I mean, I've seen it grow up through the last 20 years from something where you know, the World Wide Web was text screen on something and me emailing, emailing my brother in Sweden, for instance, and saying, wow, oh, this is so cool. Now I'm going to have to ring you, <laughs> you know, getting instant messages back from him. Um, 
that was great, that um, people have really only, the, the world has really only encountered um, the technology of computing in the last decade. That, and they think it, people now, the generation now, thinks it's existed for nearly you know, all time, but it hasn't. So maybe we're still catching up a little bit with that. But because it's virtual, it's a great opportunity to embrace it and let women embrace it. Now, as you can see by the people's comments, maybe there's still some um, misogyny happening there, some old world, um, I don't know, what do you call it, prejudices, prejudices and things like that come to the fore. Um, the cost to our society would be that you don't get enough virgins in years. If you only let 50% of the people have the ideas, then you will only get 50% of the possible ideas that could be eventually. I mean, there's lots of things that come into the equation with that. I think that would be the, the main thing, that you would have not enough variety of ideas and things. But if people are smart, and our now generation, you know, like the young people, the people who are in their 30s and 40s and 50s, <laughs> they should be aware enough to understand that it doesn't matter what gender you are, it's okay to become, you know, a scientist or a mathematician, computer specialist, you know, physicist, mathematician. If those things are okay, you will work the local I don't know if that answers your question, though. <laughs> so, yeah. I think the purpose here is just to have some discussion of the issues. So yes. Yeah, great. Shanika, um, as somebody who's involved with recruiting into the university, um, can you maybe talk a little bit about um, the kinds of reactions you get um, if you go and you talk to a high school um, student about studying computer science and sort of what issues you see them raising? So, so what do we think about the awareness? I think it is do with the teachers also. So people call about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. Science and math, the teachers know. Technology and engineering, they know less. So they talk about it less. So I, I was working, I'm working with a girls school in Victoria, trying to engage with their year eight students. And the school was there very keen, and they invited me and said, can you develop a module? And deliver to your students and um, I said yes we are very happy to do that we'll engage and you could see the teacher the first thing she can ask it, who is going to teach it I'm going to teach it right so they, they had this the teachers have the fear from technology so I said they'll use a very visual programming language but still there are there is resistance from them to introduce it to them the students so this gives me the feeling the teachers talk very less about these technology related things or they do science and mathematics. So I think that's one of the biggest barriers I think for them taking up technology oriented subjects. So unless you try to introduce a subject in technology that might not really get, break the barriers at the early stages. The university level may be too late. Chris, could you maybe talk a little bit about um, the challenges that you see women facing in the classroom or, or um, once they get to university? Actually, I think one of the biggest challenges is actually even before people get to the university is in the high school system or within their families or in the Australian culture of the negative stereotypes for ICT or maths or, or even engineering as a career for women. One example is a place like Melbourne Uni. Most of our undergrad, our local undergraduates come from a fairly small number of um, select entry schools around Melbourne including some of the top women's private schools. And so we had a campaign to go and go to those schools and try and raise awareness of computer science, and not for women in computer science and IT in general. And I was told by one of the um, 
senior academics in the department, but the response that they got from the principal of one of the top women's schools was, oh, we want our women, our girls, to go on to be the leaders in society, not the technicians. <laughs> and that's coming from one of the top women's private schools. That's how institutionalised it's become in Australian culture. And yet I see in contrast in when I was at high school, um, we had a big wave of um, students from the former, from what was then the Soviet Union. And they were the girls there were fantastic at maths. It wasn't a stereotype. I think it was part of a, a legacy from after the Second World War when a large proportion of the male population had been killed off during the war. And women were, you know, it was a national, it was national survival that they needed women going into uh, the sciences and engineering and maths. And there wasn't the same stereotype there. I noticed we're managing to achieve probably the best gender balance amongst our PhD candidates at the moment in computer information systems because we have a lot of female Iranian students studying. And so there's certain, certain societies are doing much better at achieving this balance. I'm not quite sure what the factors are. But that seems to be a real... Where, where it comes from, it's not just from male... I'm sure there's an element of still of male resistance of women coming into certain fields, but amongst so amongst women as well, there's this feeling of don't go into that. So clearly, many of us in this room have kind of fought against the stereotype, or at least realized that the stereotype isn't quite accurate. Um, I personally find computer science a very creative thing, whereas I think many, many, many people believe that it's not. Um, and so we've highlighted some of the issues. I guess the real question for me is, uh, what do we do about it, right? So we've heard um, going into schools, uh, trying to change attitudes, um, highlighting in the media perhaps what what um, the role of women can be, um, what the role of technology is, that it's not just technicians, which is, that's frightening, Chris. <laughs> um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on what sort of actions we can take to maybe um, change the situation and harness some of the, um, the enthusiasm of, of all of the people and, and who come to events like this who are obviously concerned members of <laughs> this population. So, uh, Elaine, could you I just wonder that? whether Chris said the, perhaps one of the most important things that we should be looking at, if, if there is a general perception in fact that leaders are not people who come from engineering and technical areas, then, you know, as a parent, I'd say, well, my children go into that. I, I had a, a very different upbringing. My father, I think, would pro probably have died of shock if I hadn't gone into science or maths or engineering, and I did chemical physics. And if you think Tony Clark can you do science to you try to have people who don't do chemical physics, um, <laughs> which is mostly computer science and physics. Um, but I, I do really wonder whether we shouldn't be looking at that at that at that point, which is the perception of science, maths, and engineering, and and you know why would girls go into another second-rate career if it's only um, they're going to be technicians or some other low-paid, well not necessarily low-paid, but less low-profile profession. So I would say, as a group, perhaps we should be joining with some some other areas and, and really trying to promote the value of science and engineering as a precursor to a business career, to success, to leadership. Great. Here, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I was actually thinking that um, that was a really naive remark of that um, mm -hmm. teacher because so many of the world's successful people actually have science backgrounds at some level or another. They, you can't lead a technology company without knowing about the technology. Um, and those who do try to lead without knowing about the technology, they fail spectacularly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it really is a spectacular fail. Um, you can't make policies in science if you have zero background in those things. So, she's, uh, she or him, I'm not too sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they're probably not, um, they probably steer themselves in a, a bit of a corner there. Um, 
maybe that's what you need. To, the message needs to come through to people a little bit more that you're not stifled into a small corner just because you choose that. I mean, I was doing um, talks to young children from prep to year 12, I think it was, back in way away <laughs> when I was still here studying. And um, I was telling them, you know, like, being a physicist, let's should explore the world. At that time, I wanted to be a physicist more than anything else, and you know, I was exploring the world that way, and did let me explore the world. But that's the whole thing about science and technology. It opens up whole world to you. You can go anywhere in your career. You just need to find the right niche that, has, that needs your talents. And that's the key. You know, and you move forward, and you move forward through that niche. Um, I'm now, after being a humble physicist and a system administrator of um, and that I'm now a manager of a, a large computing facility. And one of these days in the future, I'm going to be a CEO of some company. You know, that's my aim. I mean, I'm not going to try to aim too high, but if I can get there, I'm going to go. You know, that's what I like to do. And I'm not going to let anything stop me from that. And my education, my background, should let me go in that path. So it's nothing to stop anyone from doing what they want to. You want to be an astronaut? Have some science and engineering behind you because that's the way to go. Those sorts of things. So you just have to get the message that having these backgrounds gives you a much better chance of a large career than the small chance that you are going to make it on one of those, um, what are they, those uh, talent shows or these reality shows and become a superstar in your own world because that's what I see. The message given by some parents or some people, you know, by peers to the kids. I know my daughter, who is now nine, she's shocked when she tells me about her friends wanting to play um, uh, supermodel shopping or something like that by her friends. That's their, that's their way of interacting with the web. Um, my kids like interacting with Minecraft because they like building the things. So that's a we encourage that. But, you know, like, we're, in, we're trying to steer them to creative hobbies and that these other kids are encouraged to shop online. I don't know. You know it's, it's the perspective of how the parents are dealing with things or how the, the peers are, are giving things to the students and kids and stuff like that. So it really does start at a young age. But, um, you know. Well, one of the things I liked in the documentary was the girl who admits she likes Gossip Girl. You know? <laughs> I, I, I think, well, yeah, it's totally okay. And, and I think one of, the, one of the points that we heard from High school students in the film was that, um, in fact, it's it's great to build on what you know, right? Mm -hmm. Could somebody else have built an app that was specifically designed to help kids study for the advanced placement exam? Probably not, because that's not an issue for them. So you know, somebody's building those websites that are about um, supermodels, and while you may not appreciate the content. Um, there's a technology that underlies yeah. that. Well, okay, I should, I should sort of say that I don't appreciate kids being still on their Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, you know, to justify that. I mean, I don't see there's anything wrong with playing. I let my kids play as much as they like. And, and sure, know, no, but what I mean is that there are opportunities yeah. in technology which are actually reflective of the things that, you know, nine-year-old girls care about. And, and, that's, and that's fine. Um, Irina, did you want to talk a little bit about um, academia specifically and some of the issues you were alluding to earlier? Um, yes, I, what I faced in my career was that you know, what I could see with my own eyes was that while doing, as I said, you know, I did my undergraduate degree in Romania, which is you know, recognized for um, being very, very strong in mathematics. And there, I think the proportion was like 60, 40, if not higher, in the favor of women. Um, then I did my PhD here, and then I did all sorts of contract research. I had contract research positions. Um, but looking at the progression, career progression is, what I could see was that in Canada, for example, there were men who would do their PhD and then could apply for a um, position in the in a university and get it. There were women who 
finish PhDs at the same universities with the same supervisors, they would never get a position in universities. They had to have another year or two of postdocs somewhere else to prove themselves. That proof was never required from the main um, graduates. Does that reflect biases on the hiring committee? You said? I think so, yes. Um, I don't know why. I can't quite tell you, but where I was, while um, the PhD students, it was it was a mix of genders. Postdocs was almost entirely women, so you had to do this extra step. And I think this is still the case. I'm not quite sure how to change that, and I don't know if it also comes from our perception that we need to prove ourselves more before we. You know, that approach is that, you know, I don't trust that I'm quite ready while men are more willing to say I'm ready to tackle this and project that and maybe we should change this in ourselves and try to um, act like that more. I don't really know. But what, there's one thing that I wanted to mention. You know, one of the advantages of IT jobs, and now I'm being sexist myself, is they're actually quite flexible. You can work from home. It doesn't matter if you're in an office or if you work from home. That would give women, it, would, it should become more attractive to women if we want to stay home. And if you have a child that you have, you know, you, know, you have the flexibility that you don't have necessarily in other professions. And I think that that's not played enough as an advantage. And I think it, it should be because it's one of the most flexible professions you can get. You know, you work with the internet. Um, you can send stuff off instantly. That's actually been an issue of controversy recently because um, Marissa Mayer in her new position in Yahoo has <coughs> yes, um, she terminated exactly. uh, uh, working from home. And I think that's quite interesting for someone at female who's just had her own child and who's at that stage of her career um, to implement a policy like that. It's, it's, it is quite controversial. It is. Yes. Uh, Priscilla, I had a question now my brain kind of um, disappeared. Um, I was hoping that you might address um, some of the issues of transferring from, from one area to another. So, you know, you've come from mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. but you've moved into a different era, um, um, kind of context in, yeah. in IBM research. Um, has that been difficult for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I started using a computer very late in my life, so I've been probably yeah, kind of year 10 BCE. So I always had a fear of computers and actually I think that's one of the things that I regret most is, you know, I think they alluded it to it in the, um, in the presentation just now, you kind of you fail once and then you kind of just go, I can't do that. So that's something that I actively have to be mindful of and aware so that I can then address that address that issue and to improve. So, yes, yeah, certainly moving into a traditional IT-based company certainly does have its challenges, but, you know, some of the great things is I've worked with people like Irina, who's, who's great at, at computers. So, you know, I think that we need to um, continually push and advance ourselves and not to, not to be scared to put our hands up and, and say, yeah, I'll take that senior job or, um, yeah, I, I will leave that project. Um, so that's something that I, I try to do myself as well. Okay. So I've asked a lot of questions, and I have a lot more. But I'd like to um, open it up to you guys. Hi, another meal. Yay, hello. <laughs> Hi, um, I'd like to open it up to you guys to, do you have, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask <coughs> anybody on the panel, or just a general question. Uh, I don't have a question, but I have, so, um, at, at the university here, there are at least two or three programs where we can actually go into school and um, be a role model. So there's one called Into Science, and um, so you just basically go into the school, spend some time with the kids, help them with their homework, 
or give a presentation. So I don't, I haven't started on it yet, but I'm enrolled to start next semester. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I think um, the way to get more people into computer science and into maths, because I'm in the maths department, and as Irina was saying, like there's two um, female professors in our whole department, and all of the rest are male. So um, that's yeah, that's an example of um, what Irina was saying. So um, once you go past the PhD level, there's still a lot of difficulties. Um, yeah, and then the other program that I was um, thinking of was so it's called um, the so networking for women, and that's also so where graduate students. Um, can serve as role models for undergraduate students. So they have these young girls um, looking up to um, older girls, which can also help them um, develop their career in these areas. And so the people who are in charge of it, they try to um, balance, so they try to group undergraduates who are in science. So they try to group people who are in the same fields, which is good. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that. That actually raises a point which um, I'm surprised nobody has mentioned, which is the idea of mentoring and the role that mentoring can play for anybody really in, in their career development. But um, perhaps it's particularly important in the context where um, you're in a minority group and you sort of feel like you're fighting against these ridiculous stereotypes. And um, I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts on that. I've done any thoughts. You have. I have done that here. Australia. You were a, you were a mentor or you were a mentee? Oh, no, not mentee, mentee, but a mentor. I suppose in some ways, Rachel Webster was a bit of a mentor for me at some point too, um, but that was very late in my PhD. But um, I did that in here in Australia. We had um, sort of like a, a program at the physics department where we had people come in to do work experience. We had one young lady come in at sixteen. We became, became friends over time with that, which she wanted to continue on. I also been in America for a couple of times with down high school students and, and doing outreach programs and things like that because that's what the mm -hmm. physics um, group was doing at the time, a lot of outreach and like mentoring and that sort of work. And I think it works a lot for the postgrad under sort of level, quite well, or postgrad and high school level, that sort of level. But I, I think it really works at that level. I mean, like now I feel like I'm a little bit past mentoring someone who is in their 20s. I don't think we have quite the same connection anymore. Um, and plus I have you know, too many other commitments and things like that. So it, may, it means that I wouldn't be well enough connected to that person. I wouldn't have quite a too time for it. And someone who's in a PhD might have more time for those sorts of things. So, you know, I, that's not saying that I don't like doing it, but I really recommend it for people who have, who have the role model of being in a graduate school or a postgraduate school. So. Well, I mean, I, I've done it quite a lot, a lot of, and I've been quite successful. But I would really encourage people to, to find a mentor, um, mm -hmm. if you're a mentor or a fan being. Um, and I think you'll find there are a lot of people in, see, actually, I do think you can count on with people, <coughs> you work with people like you, because you've got the networks, and that's yeah, really yeah. strong. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of people in um, business, in leadership roles who are actually really, really happy to give them give of their time. They just need to be asked. So I would strongly encourage finding a mentor. Yes, yeah, so I think that that's the difference between the two things that you said, you know, the difference between a um, program that actually, you know, actively goes out and tries to mm -hmm. mentor people and between having people asking for help. Um, and it doesn't have to be help, advice. We're all happy to share what we've learned and I do this, we do this at IBM Research and we're both quite new at IBM Research. The lab has, is less than two years old and we didn't know where we landed mm -hmm. and we just reached out and asked people to, to share their experience with us and they're only happy to do so. So and it's also great to build your network as well yes. because often they're more than happy to you know, introduce I mean, frankly, who would say no when you go and say, I think you're great, can you help me speak?
in some ways for the, the women who are in the room today, there's almost a, a burden on you to act as role models for, this, for the people coming through, the women coming through behind you. And making yourself available as a, a mentor for if you're a PhD student, for, the new, for a new PhD student coming through, or if you're a senior student, for a, uh, a senior undergraduate, for a junior undergraduate, or if you have contacts with a high school. It's, it, it helps establish those, establishes those networks, but it also reflects on, helps you reflect on yourself, that when you're helping someone else, you realise, hey, I should know something about this. <laughs> it gets over that imposter syndrome, in some ways, that you think, oh, God, I'm just here, I don't really know what I'm doing with people. What, what am I doing here? They're even paying me a scholarship to do this. Um, you actually have a lot more skills and capabilities than you probably give yourself credit for. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to build that confidence up. I know when I, so I was only recently promoted to professor and I'll be honest with you, I never thought I'd make it to professor in my career. It wasn't something I'd picture I'd have the skills to do. I just sort of ended up there. Um, and I asked um, Rob Evans, who's the laureate professor in the university, um, so what's your advice to a new professor? And he just said, oh well, you've made it to that level now. Your job is to help other people. And you can reflect on that yourselves with people you're able to help and develop yourselves by doing that. Great. Well, I'm going to let Chris have the last word. So, um, thank you. I want to thank all of the panelists um, for, for their time and for coming tonight and for engaging in this interesting discussion. Let's take it upstairs and continue the conversation informally over some pizza. Um, can we maybe thank everybody? <laughs> And so, um, on behalf of Nikta, who kindly sponsored the pizza, um, let's go upstairs and have some pizza. And uh, thank you all for coming. Can I just add, uh, I want to thank Karen. Sorry, uh, she, this was her idea, and she organized everything. So, thank you. I think this has been a really extraordinary um, event for us. And thank you all for your invaluable um, input. Uh, it's been really uh, great. Um, to hear all these um, um, ideas and talks. Just thank, thank you all to the panelists and to Karen and all of you. Thank you.